The 1970 Dodge Challenger known as Vanishing Paint is back. Now, if you follow the channel closely, you saw this on Sick Week, but you're going, wait a minute, a lot has changed, obviously. So here's the story of how it made it to Sick Week. We've got a lot of work to do. Now, we had originally planned on taking the 1971 Chevelle, the blue one that we're calling Liberty, but unfortunately, after a dyno session, which you'll see soon, there was a lot of work to complete that I just couldn't do in my current physical condition. And more on that in a minute as well. So we decided to dust off the vanishing paint, but of course, this also needs a lot of work as well in order to pass sick week tech. See, they need to be 100% street legal. <laughs> no. So let's dig in. We've got a lot of work to do. And with the pivot, I've got three days to get this thing to Orlando and ready for sick week. Great. Right now through the end of February, you could get entered for a chance to win this custom-built, one-of-a-kind Gen 3 Hemi Swap 1982 Chevrolet C10. All you have to do is go to vicegripgarage.com, grab yourself some merchandise, and every $5 gets you an entry. For official merchandise and the official giveaway rules, go to vicegripgarage.com, and good luck. Well, let's address the alligators in the room. Now, I mentioned we were gonna take the 71 Chevelle. Uh, you'll see that dyno, nothing terrible. Look, the engine needed sealed up and some other things. Normally not a big deal. I was planning on pulling the engine transmission, resealing everything, got a lower timing cover slash oil pan leak. I think the rear main is weeping and potentially the front pump seal on the transmission is also leaking. You can't be dropping oil on the track. They'll just, they'll kick you off, right? Well. I can't currently do that. Uh, see, I got in a little bit of a motorcycle accident, a dirt bike actually, horsing around. I've ridden them all my life. Uh, just one of those things, too muddy, too much throttle, and a combination of my front forks blowing out uh, set me over the bars pretty hard. I've got uh, a bunch of busted up ribs, dislocated some fingers. Uh, so it's just hard to breathe and talk and twist and lift and push and pull and lean back or generally stand up or walk. But other than that, everything is fine. Um, we'll be able to work through this. Got to wire this car. That's going to be the biggest thing. In fact, let's make a list really quick and we can start ticking these things off. Jessica's going to be in the shop helping me because I just, I can't contort myself under the dashboard and do a bunch of other stuff. So she's going to help try to get this thing ready for us. I'm actually really glad we're breaking this car out, it's just a shame to let it sit there. So it's fun to be able to use it for stuff like this. And I've been procrastinating this very process. I'd be driving this darn near every day, you know, if I had lights and stuff like that. So I'm really excited to get this stuff done. So um, the engine runs great, right? We know that it runs out really strong. Steve Dulcich, David Freiberger did an excellent job on that. It handles great. The brakes are phenomenal. It just has to be, 100% street legal. I wish my marker would work. Isn't this brand new? What is going on here? There we go. So we need headlights, for example. We need tail lights. We need brake lights. They check all this stuff in tech. We need blinkers. Uh-oh. We need a horn. We need a bat hold down. Uh, I need to look at a power steering leak. Again, we don't want to be pulling up to do our burnout or stage and we're dripping oil on the track. That's a big no-no. Um, we're not going to need harnesses or anything like that because the car runs 12s right now. If it had a different gear, it'd probably run 1170, 1180 around there, but um, we're just going to leave what's in it. I am going to change, and I think you guys are going to like this. Well, maybe some of you. Tires and wheels. 
There's nothing wrong with these. I think they're like some cheap Riddlers or something. It looks pretty cool, kind of has the pro touring road course look right now. I'm gonna be using these wheels with some slicks and I'm gonna be putting some different tires and wheels on for the street driving and all of that stuff. And I think I'll just honestly keep them on for daily driving the rig. And then I could just use this wheel for the slicks instead of buying new fancy wheels for the said slicks. Uh, we gotta figure out how to carry tires, right? Cause we're gonna have our slicks. Um, and then we need the load tools parts, we need to change oil, we got to check all the fluids, transmission, rear end, we should probably even grease this thing, I haven't really once overed it at all, I drove us from Arizona all the way home, I don't think we did anything, I think we put sparkulators in it once, and uh, gas, that was about that was about it. Well, here's our list to get us started. Lighting is obviously the biggest concern here. Uh, I think I can get the front half hot wired. I think they hot wired it in once before actually. We hot wired it again on the way back from Arizona. If we're gonna re hot wire that, ideally get it on a switch, and then the whole back half of this car is gonna need to be wired. Because if we don't got the tail lights and the brake lights and the blinkers, eh, failed. Great. More digitals. Always. So I was kind of just farting around in here trying to figure out what's what. I found my little pigtail thing. I must have made this and uh, got these looped back around. And sure enough, I got headlights on the switch. So I've already done that. I forgot about that. This is a questionable portion is all this rear wiring. There's going to be running lights, left and right blinker. There's going to be probably dome light in here. There's a fuel sending wire. We have to figure out all that. This is junk. There's one click, but I don't know if that's right or if that's neutral. So we're gonna have to somehow get into that wiring, which I believe is all this. Add a switch or something for blinkers. I don't, it's, we're gonna really get in it, I think is what I'm saying here. Guy's gonna have to take a, some time here soon and just clean this place. It, bring a broom. Let's get in the body carrier, see what we got. Yeah. Oh, nothing, well that's good, right? Oh wow, it's a lot rustier than I remember. Was I just ignoring this on purpose? I must have been. Uh, reason I'm in here is I'm just, it's easiest to follow the wiring back here and then we can quickly figure out, like right here, black wire goes to, uh, must be license plate light. Start following some of this stuff around so we could determine, you know, what's what. I'm not quite a Mopar feller yet, anyway. So, I don't have the wiring down pat just quite yet. Guy's gonna have to get in here soon and address some of this before it just gets out of hand, you know? Okay, so yeah, this is the wiring I'm talking about. We're just gonna start chugging through this, pulling some light bulbs, taking a look at this stuff. We got green, pink, brown. Okay, so we got black, green, brown, and pinkish red. This is probably a ground or running this traditionally, even on GM stuff, is going to be tail lights, blinkers. This is probably, I thought it was going to be the fuel, but this looks fuel sendish, like a dark blue. Okay. Well, what's pink then? Anyway, give me a minute. Oh, pink is this? I thought it was black. Oh, that's backup light. Okay. All right. See? That easy. Now... What we're going to do is we'll pop the power barn up there, see what we got going on for wiring in that particular area, make sure we got hot into the fuse panel, and then we can start hot wiring and jumping this stuff so we can make sure that we got good grounds, the lights are working, all that stuff, before we start even worrying about 
making our own blinker circuits and flashers and switches and stuff like that. David Freiberger cracks me up. Guy's got so much going on, so many vehicles. It's got to be hard for him to keep track, just like me, I guess. He started an episode of Roadkill here in a dart, and he thought it had all the wiring and lights. We popped the hood. There wasn't even a harness in the thing, so we had to go take it out of my duster and put it in his car, which is fine. We got the lights working and stuff. This is looking very similar. I see a lot of open slots on the bulkhead connector. Great. Let's see. What other Mopars do I have we can... Maybe we just make it instead. That could be a thing. It's got headlights in it. That's neat. I am seeing a little bit of wiring. Maybe we're going to get lucky here, though. Probably not. Horns are in it. Here, I'll let you take a look. So, yep, there's the wiring for the headlights. Obviously, those are working with the switch, but this is what I'm talking about. There's just a lot of stuff missing, you know. Um, things like the wipers don't work and everything else. So I was just questioning if we had, you know, a main power wire through the bulkhead into the fuse block or something we could jump off of, and I'm thinking hopefully that's that one there. Those other wires are for the ignition exclusively, which is kind of hot wired in right now. I would have done the same thing. They did a great job throwing this together as quick as I did, put it back on the road. We've got horns over here, which is great. I did pick up a universal one. Maybe we won't need that now. In fact, we can jump it with these test leads, see if they toot or make some sort of noise or something. We could put that on a switch and we can get a horn off the list really quick. Uh, let me test that fast and then we'll keep on moving. All right, got my test lead hooked up here. Oh, dust blew out of it. <laughs> All right. Ah, that one's working. Let's see if I can feel this other one. Oh, yeah. I kind of like the lower tone one. All right. Bottom one's the low one. That's the one we're going to use, I think. So, good. That should be very simple. We just... Uh, run a wire into the cabin, into a switch, back out over here, boop, horn, not too worried about that. Okay, let's go see if we can hot wire the taillights now. Well, I've been cracking away at her here. I did find a uh, power takeoff on the fuse panel under here, one labeled bat, go figure. So that's good, we got a power source there if and we need be. Also been kind of pinning out all this stuff here, this big connector that goes to the rear. And uh, I think I've got it all figured out here. Now black is running lights, green is left tail and blink, brown is right tail and blink, blue is fuel sending unit, pink and yellow is dome light, and violet, I believe, is the backup light. We need, we don't need all that. Well, most of it, except maybe two or seven of them. The bad news is when I'm power probing this or sending power back through, because I really wanted to splice in up here for blinkers, I have a big problem in the column here. There's something really messed up in this and all the plastic. It's not camming and snapping and adjusting the way it should. So we're going to have to basically make our whole proprietary custom, unique rear harness is what we're going to do. And we're going to do that by basically just taking power out of here for like running lights because that still works on a switch. And then the tail lights and blinkers, we're just going to have to feed into this and kind of make our unique setup in the back. Jessica already actually ran one wire for me up behind the, the panel here into the trunk, but I'm gonna kind of show you what we got going on right now. Okay, so this should be running lights, all four. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then bright on the left side. Yes. Bright on the right. Mm -hmm. Bright both. Yep. Okay, yeah, so. There, that's the pins and the rear harness. So now if I could just get all my toggle switches and brake light switch teed into that, we're gonna be able to make things happen in the back. We just gotta get a flash rear line and some other stuff, and I'll show you guys how to do that. Sounds really complicated. It's actually not that bad. And here's the start of it though. So back here, again, we had the colors. One is uh, dark green, one is brown. And you can see that I've ran a red wire into here and have this connected right now. Well, that's because originally, if you were to have a blinker 
or tail light, both these would go off on both sides. I'm going to have to split them up. Uh, these are 1157 bulbs, which means they have two filaments in them, basically a high and low or two circuits. So black is running lights, and then I can have tail light come into this, and then the plan is to have this one be the blinker. And the reason I'm doing it that way is I can use two of the existing wires and only run one to a brake light switch. So in theory, flip the light switch on, all four lights come on. If I hit the brake, I'm going to ignite the second circuit in the 1157s. Inside lights will bright for brakes, but then if I hit the blinker, the outsides are going to blink to whatever direction we're going. It's hillbilly McGoverish, but listen, it's going to work for tech. They just want to see when you hit the brake, something comes on, and then you got blinkers. And that's what we're doing here. Should work, right? Let's hope so. So Jessica's going to be the gopher. I can't really be climbing around right now. So she's going to help me pull all the wires we need and um, complete these circuits. And then I got to start designing some sort of blinker system. So with this switch, we got headlights. Harness is hooked in. I took the two pins out we need for, I guess it'll be our blinkers and our, yeah, our blinkers. I'm already confusing myself. I got to write this down. So then back here, you can see it's dim on both sides. So that's our running lights. So all we have to do is just flip the lights on. So that circuit is done. Here's kind of what I'm going for here. Running is all four. We'll use the outers to blink. I got my color wires in there. Stop is going to be the red wire that we're running to both. And that's ran up here for now that I got to hook into a switch. And they changed the brakes on this car. And when they changed the brakes, it changed the action of the pedal. So now the... And Jessica's going to have to get it for me. I can't get under there, I don't think. There's a bracket that holds the brake light switch. It's not even close to hitting the arm. So the brakes are always on. Which is probably the part of the problem when why they started digging into this stuff. So we need to add a brake light switch. We need to add a flasher. And we need to add a flasher. Oh, I guess we just call it blinker switch. How do you spell blinker switch? I just went through every few inches and put some tape to kind of just clean it up a little bit and got it clipped back up out of the way so that hopefully our luggage and stuff won't be catching on it and ripping it back apart. Got to start on this blinker circuit try here. So what we're going to have, and we might be able to use the power going into the original flasher, which I believe on this particular vehicle has hanging off the old Sniggerette pouch, the ashtray, you know what I mean? So we need 12 volts coming into a two post flasher. Okay. And then that's going to come into a switch. And this is a three-way switch. So it has power coming in, and we're gonna have left, and we're gonna have right. So basically all I gotta do is find 12 volts, wire in a flasher, put it into a switch, we'll be able to flip that to left, and this flasher is gonna go ahead and flash that connection, and that's gonna send it down the original harness to the tail lights that we've already snipped and separated, both left and right. It should be that simple because our brake light switch which is a normally open switch, or excuse me, yeah, normally open switch. We're gonna have the same thing, 12 volts coming in. This is gonna go to our brakes, which is now that red wire. And when you depress the pedal, this plunger then comes out, closes these contacts, boom, that 12 volt comes right through and ends up into our red wire that goes to the other lights that we Separate. I am. Are you confused yet? Because I'm surely getting there. I thought this would help writing it down, but it's making it worse. So what are we doing? We need 12 volts. Got to find a flasher and a switch. Start figuring out. Oh, I guess we should probably make some sort of panel for all these switches because we're going to have horn, 
We're going to have blinkers. I also have an ignition and a start button that's laying under the seat. Maybe we move that somewhere. Jessica, you want to try to find somewhere to put a switch panel on this thing? For Pete's sake. I pulled the old flasher out of the dash there. I thought it was initially bad because I ran voltage to it and was testing on the other side of the meter. And then I realized I needed to pull a load on it. So I just spliced in the right blinker here, what's going to be the right blinker, and ran 12 volt hot up to there and you can hear it. That's that rapid heating and cooling in there. And sure enough, it's blinking. So that's what our blinker circuit's gonna look like on the right hand side here. I thought I might need to run into town and get another one, but I think this one's gonna be fine. Jessica is now, um, you're getting ready to run some wires, aren't you? Tempting. So what she's doing right now is gonna run these two wires, which is gonna be our blinker circuitry under the dash for me and we decided to make a panel where the old radio used to be because well we don't need one of this the pipes sound fantastic so she's going to run that quick i'm going to go over to the table and cut out a little plate so currently in the car down by the center console ish there's a switch and a button for ignition we're going to change that up and uh, going to move that up to this panel this is approximately the size jessica cut this out so we're going to have a made ignition I'm going to put a different push button in it. This is going to be our blinkers left and right. So this goes both directions there. And then this push button is going to be our horn. That'll be over here. So all four different sizes of switches here. So what I'm going to have to do is get the, I don't know, the measure stick out with numbers on it, measure these up, figure out what size holes I need, arrange them on this sheet. And then I can, Put all that into TurboCAD here in a minute, cut it out on the table. We'll bend this lip and then hopefully it'll slip right in the car there. Well, I got the panel cut out and decided to uh, scribe it. I also fox tinted it. I, the bare metal just looked dumb in the cab. So if you look closely, you can see horn, turn, start, ignition. I had a vice grip garage down here, but then I roughed it up and make it, made it look you know, a lot older. There's some greens and browns and silver and black. So we've got uh, obviously ignition on, we'll have a start button, you got blinkers either way, and then horn, and uh, drilled some holes there. So we'll just put some nut certs and we'll be able to jam this in the dash. Put all these in first so we could just lay it out on the council there, wire all this in, make it a lot easier, and then just plop the whole thing in at once. So there was a bunch of junk kind of down in here. That switch was breaking anyway. So this stuff is going away, this, this thing, and I'm um, going to move it all into here. So we've got our ignition wires, we've got our blinker wires in here. Um, that's where the flasher went, going to um, pull some power from there. And then uh, oh, going to pull power from the... Fuse block up there as well. Actually, I'm gonna have Jessica do both of those. And then I can kind of just sit here with my fitting case and uh, whittle this all together. And this is gonna kind of go up in like that. So, be a little cleaner, a little neater, and have everything in one place is the goal. Well, it's gonna be pretty cramped quarters inside as I continue to wire up that switch panel and I've gotta get uh, some hot, some 12 volts somewhere under the dash to start wiring in some of this stuff. So it doesn't make sense to have Jessica and I just smashed in there. So she's going to go off on her own project. And one of the biggest changes we're going to make with this car is we have officially decided to take off all of the stickers. Now, some of you may be for that, some of you may not be for that. But I think it's time we kind of start our own path with this car. It obviously has a tremendous amount of history with the stickers, but it's been photographed and video graphed a lot so there's a lot of documentation about that i even called mr freiberger and said what do you think and long story short he said i can't believe you haven't already done it so we're going to go ahead and just strip this thing off probably maybe even the glass yeah, clean that off so. so jessica's going to grab a heat gun she's going to get moving on that and i'm going to keep wiring and we'll meet in the middle somewhere i got some more wires i need her to pull eventually for like the horn and some other stuff but we're making some progress. I think the hardest part is done, just kind of figuring out what we're gonna do anyway. So, you ready?
As you can see, these are actually coming off pretty easily. We got the Game of Thrones, excuse me, we got the Game of Cones sticker taken off. Um, we got Roadkill coming off. Kind of sad to see that go, but also really exciting for what we're going to do with it. But yeah, you just heat this up a little bit. Really doesn't take much at all. I'm kind of surprised actually how easy it's coming off. And it seems like to get just a little bit. And then she comes. Sounds like it's coming off good. Yeah, it's taking some paint with it though. Is it? Yeah, not like a lot, just here and there. It's definitely. Is it like leaving like outlines of the letters? Well, there's already outlines of the letters um, from the stickers, but no, not really. Yeah, so it's coming off pretty good. Jessica's got this side done. It's like a whole different car. Now, when she gets the stickers done on the other side, I'm gonna have her come back. She's gonna grab some gray scotch bright and some like uh, spray away or something and just clean this up. Give it all the sticker outlines and residues. Try to blend some of this in. And that's gonna look great. Now the tires and wheels we have chosen for this, I think you guys are gonna love them. It's just gonna transform this whole car into something else. Oh, well guys got most that wired up. And then I got the rooting around in here and I did get this bent into position. The old, where did the old switch go? This old corroded thing. And that, uh, well, wasn't working very good. But also, like I was saying, it was flat over here. It wasn't even close to hitting the rod. But now, that should hit. And then I picked up this heavy duty one, which is more of a universal switch. So you can see the threads on this one are a lot longer. So when we double nut this in there, when we hit the brake pedal, that's gonna come out, contact, we get brake lights. And then that'll be from the original power source, but we're going around the column. Everything is wired around that now. So we'll come into the switch over here, which then goes into our homemade harness and should go to the rear. And theoretically, we should have brake lights. We'll have running lights up here. We'll have blinkers. Everything should be good. Let me uh, try to get this up in there. Well, the guy's got the control panel in, if you will, and I think I got the wiring finished at least good enough to run a test here. We're gonna try the running lights, brake lights, blinkers, blinkers with brakes, and make sure all of that stuff works here. So, this should be running lights. Boom. Okay, well, wait now. We got... Oof, we got a left blinker? We do. How about a right one? We, we have that too. Okay, and then we got a brake. Ow. Oh yeah, lots of them. And then what about brake and blinker? Okay, yeah. Well, I'll be dipped. Plus, we got a horn. Ignition's wired up too, but I already got some sparkulators pulled out. I think that's going to do her for tonight, though. Going to throw the earth pounders up, get a little bit of rest. You know what I mean? Tomorrow, we still got a lot to do. The brain part is over, I think. Thank goodness, the digitals. You know what I mean? Actually, really not that hard. Don't let anybody spooky about blanker circuits systems stuff like that it's actually very very simple tomorrow oil change spark lighter change check all the fluids we got to figure out a roof rack still got a pack there's a lot to do see you bright and early cold snack time finally well hey good morning we got another day ahead of us here on the 1970 dodge challenger known as vanishing paint last night we got a ton of work done we got headlights working, running lights, brake lights, blankers, horn. We installed some sort of NASA style control system up there with all the beep boops and levers and doodads. So I think the hard part is down. Now we're just up to the mechanical stuff. Thank goodness. 
We got to change spark lighters today. We got to change the oil. We got to check the rear diff, do a nut and bolt check front to back, take a look at a power steering leak. We've got tires and wheels to put on and a roof rack. It's gonna be another busy day, but I think we're gonna be able to hopefully get through this rather quickly. Last night, it was kind of funny, I was smiling. I was using these CT Co pliers made by Crescent. These were stamped in 1938, and they're an incredible piece of family history for me. Being my grandpa was born in 1931, these undoubtedly belonged to my great grandpa, and I found them out in our cow pasture. So they must have fallen out of his pocket or a saddlebag, or maybe they had a pouch back then, I'm not sure, but I'm sure that's where my grandpa learned to carry a player 24 seven. And ironically, I carry a Leatherman with me today, 24 seven. Pretty neat piece of family history there. Gonna keep that forever. I think we're gonna jump right into the sparkulators. We might even do a compression test just to test things over. We're a little bit worried. Uh, Mr. Freiberger had warned me when I bought the car, I should have put like a road course or a rally style pan in it, something with baffles. And I took it to Barber Motorsports for a charity event and ran it around a course pretty hard. I'm worried that I oil starved it a little bit. So I wanna make sure we got good compression and we might even cut the oil filter open and just make sure we haven't damaged anything. It's got great compression, it still sounds good, but just to be sure, I don't wanna break down with the Mopar on sick week. You know what I mean? Unless you got 17 credit cards ready for parts. You know what I mean? Okay. Sparkle lighters, here we come. Now what came in the car was the Enjikitas, uh, that part number. It's heat range seven and Enjikas are a little bit different. The lower the number, the hotter the plug, the higher the colder. This is a form of racing plug and sevens were all I could find. I wanted to move to like five if possible, but I don't want to change up the style plug because the fellers that built this engine knows what it needs, right? So I'm going to pull a couple out and I'm going to show you the concern is she's running really fat. So if we can't get a hotter plug, we might have to go down and jets on the fuel maker happener. Uh, we'll just have to look through these, make sure they're consistent first of all, and then we'll make a decision. Well, I sat and thought about it for 29 seconds and we're gonna forgo the compression test because I'm pretty confident in everything is fine. If we drop the oil and the filter looks bad, then we'll rethink it. Yes, I should do that first just in case, but we're not because we don't do things right here. Speaking of right, I am gonna to try to do it right by using anises and dielectrical greases because I've never bought a real set of heads in my life and them are Edelbrock, super rip em, speed, power, aluminum heads. I don't even wanna know what them cost. So let's not wreck them, I guess. So we're gonna use this juice, which is overflowing because I never use it, and also that juice and try to try to save on them if I can. Ooh. So this is what a guy is pulling out. Oof da me. Maybe I got a lot of miles on them. I'll tell you that much. We're gonna have to keep an eye on that. Got one more on this side, then we're gonna switch over to the captain's side. Gonna cross off another easy project. Battery needs a hold down. And what was in here was this 34 plat. You know, the PLTs. Short for platinum agonums. Sure. Main reason I got this is not because it was the cheapest, definitely it was not, but it has the go handle. More importantly, it's the correct height for what looks like a dulcich made kind of holder downer unit here. The standard ones are, well, where did I put the other one? Oh, well, there it is. Look at this bad boy. She's up there. You know what I mean? So I'm gonna rip the go handle off, get her settled into the new home, and uh, get this hold down in, because that's part of tech. We cross that off the list. I know these look silly on here, but last year I got nipped for them, so we went ahead and snagged some on now. I don't know, it doesn't really do much here. For one, we got a fiberglass hood. We flipped this puppy over. I don't think any sparks are gonna come off of that. And it protrudes through, anyway. 
technically they're on there. So battery, done. Underneath the rig here, I'd forgotten about this repair here. I don't think this leaks as much as up on the sides. I kind of already cleaned that up. The TCI pan looks sharp. It was weeping a little bit, but not too bad. Seems like the output shaft seal is good. Rear end, very typical. Nothing major here. I can maybe just clean that up a little bit. It's got all the goodies in this thing. And they kind of did it semi-ish on a budget. These are QA1, but they're not the super fancy, super bouncy, coil over 75-way adjustable, blah, blah, blah. They made their own blocks or spacers for the rear sway, stuff like that. So it's nice to see that the subframes are really solid in good shape. Looking good. Anywho's, I'm going to try to get that filter out, you know, Mopar. Yeah. Why? No one knows. Good luck with that. And we'll drop this Earl's. I can't believe what I just went through, but I guess I got to because I did it. Okay, so, you know, Mopar, angle, weird. Once you finally get that loose, which took me 37 months, good luck getting it out. <laughs> yeah, you can't. You gotta go up top. So anyways, I went ahead and did that. Cut it open. There was maybe, well, you can kind of see. Well, it's hard with that sheen. There's a dozen flakes in there, maybe. I picked through this. You can see them all spread apart. Fine. There's no glitter in here. I think we're just fine. Builds plenty of oil pieces. By the way, I don't give enough credit to STP here. That's one heck of a filter. Uh, but I had to go with my boy Wix. So we got a Wix up in there. It's a little bit tighter. But we got room. Barely. I think that's why the STP was on there. Is it shorter? So we'll drop her down, throw some oils back in it. Well, oil change is done. Since it's a race motor, you know, parentheses, it needs race, no, it doesn't, just Rotella T4, because that's got plenty of zinc in it. Okay, moving on. While I was filling that up, I started scuffling on this, because we got, well, look here. There's sticker residue. Now that it's sat overnight, you can see it again over here. Sticker residue. So I started working on it with the uh, gray SOS, which I thought was going to do the job, but it's not. It did a little bit on the door. You can see we're bringing out a lot more brown, trying to blend it in, because I just don't want it so obvious that there was a, you know, pool ball on the door. But we might have to jump into some sandpaper, unfortunately. That's really sticky. If I get into Goo Gone or Paint Stripper, it's probably going to be worse. So I might test it back here, since this is such an eyesore anyway with its 14 feet of Bondo thickness. It doesn't really matter. And uh, see if I could just lightly bring that around. And then there's a shade of roadkill on the door still. We got to get that off of there. And then I got to decide. We gonna shine juice this thing or not. I also need to put some silicone. I meant to do that a long time ago and never got around to it. Gotta get some silicone in that. This poor car just really shouldn't. Well, it doesn't sit outside, but really shouldn't just go outside anymore. Needs quite a bit of work, but that's why it's called vanishing paint. It just is what it is and you drive it. It's good enough, you know? Oh boy. Guys in her now, 120 grit, 220 grit, 400 grit. Bringing out some more green in here, but trying to make it look like natural patina still. And that's all to blend in this. Bringing out some green in here and some gray, which has never been there. And I brought out a lot more green up here. Let's see how I'm still leaving the scratches. So it just kind of looks like a natural progression and that's to hide this part right here where that pool ball was 
And I'm gonna hit that here in a minute and probably drag this out just a little bit more. This is a mess, I need to hit it with a razor blade or some heat. Um, getting down to metal, I'm gonna have to hit that with some primer. But it's slowly changing. And uh, it's just a process to get all this sticker residue and kind of get it back to how it was before all that stuff went on. I'm actually liking the green and gray in the sail panel because that was kind of boring before. But there's a lot of Bondo on this, like a tremendous amount. This is where the original seam was, right here, and someone came in and just really plastered that up. But it's getting there. Well, I think that's gonna do. I don't wanna get carried away and take away from the car. And a lot of this stuff, you just can't replicate. All of these like sharp edges and things like this. So I'm just gonna let them be brought out a little bit more green, a little bit more black. I think I've got it. Once it gets cleaned up, you guys will see it'll look pretty natural. And all that sticker residue is gone. Now on this side, this is the Craigslist side of the car. Looks brand new. Gotta get rid of this. It's gonna be a little bit more tricky. Man, that's sticky. And this is a problem. Clearly can see it was a pool ball. And we're gonna have to blend this in quite a bit to make that look halfway decent. So this is gonna be a lot more brown over here. Probably some more black. It's gonna change the look of the car, unfortunately, but I just don't want that. Gugan, brake clean, stuff like that isn't gonna take this off without just melting the paint. It's gonna look worse. I've already tried it. So we gotta just do what I can with sandpaper and hope it turns out okay. Well, I popped out a little more green here, smoothed out this section, a little more dark green in there instead of just that blotch. I think I got the door good enough. Kinda just made it look like weathered there and then armware here. You know, from a guy just, you know, <whistles> out the door. And that globe is kind of, I might need just a, ouch, just a scooch. See that line? Looking at it? I might need a little there. Now I got to get the Roser Blade, because man, I don't know what this game of cone sticker was, but it's like NASA grade. I mean, I could lift the whole cart. with the, see what I'm saying? And uh, same with this one, not going so hot. I got those two left and then we're just gonna let her be. Ran some silicon around the base of the window here. Definitely not the right stuff, but that's okay. You know, it's gonna be better than nothing. I'm trying to save on that trunk a little bit. Still working on this side. Holy smokes, it's just giving me a run for the money. 68 years later, I got it. Yep. I mean, it ain't perfect, but I think we get some shine juice on this potentially. So I've got a couple areas of bare metal now. And then of course we got all the raw steel showing elsewheres in the car, you know, because that's about 92% of this vehicle. Hmm. Got a door handle that doesn't work on the other side that I've kind of ignoring. Thinking about maybe going after that, but nope, probably not. Missing a side marker light on this side, I didn't realize. Kind of a lot of details popping out of the guy now. You spend some more time with the rig, you know. But I love the look. It's very unique. Well, we'll wash this up and deal with this probably tomorrow in the daylight. Moving on to the roof rack here. So I have these brackets here, and these are actually something that, uh, you know, we're r and We're trying it out. And if they work great, it may be something if there's enough interest we offer these to the public. They're a very much universal style mount for anything with the drip rail. So you could think of all the cars that have drip rails basically, and they're gonna 
pretty much work for you. And all you need is just one by one square tubing to go through here, which is what I'm gonna do. And you could just do two rods. You could do a basket. You could make something custom, uh, which is kind of what we're gonna do. Uh, but the hard part, you know, is this piece right here. You basically just loosen this, put it on your drip rail, screw this down till it gets tight, clamp it, come back, and I haven't done this yet on this one, snug this up, and that pinches it in here and it's not gonna go anywhere. So this other one's gonna go probably, you know, and I might end up sliding these back. I have to just kind of play with it. We gotta figure out the distance it's gonna to take to run those slicks up here on the roof. And then it's got provisions here, obviously, to run straps or whatever we wanna do. So let me play with this for a minute, kind of figure out my spacing, kind of see what I wanna do here, and then we'll see if we can make something kind of cool out of these. Well, here's what I got going on. I kind of just threw up a tire here, and it was about, oh, it's a 17 inch wheel, so I'm 16 and a half here, and it seems to sit halfway decent, not quite worried about that yet. I'm just trying to get the width figured out here. Now, if I were to sell these roof rack kits, they would not come with the bar. Reason being is I couldn't ship these to you at a decent price. I'd be doing you a disservice. I think you can go to a tractor supply or a local hardware store or something like that and get your one by one square tubing. And that's basically all I did here. So I'm just clamp lighting it in here, kind of getting the look set up. And then I'm going to drill a hole. And then that hole goes right down into the clamp itself. And I should be able to duplicate that for the back. And for this particular car, I might even weld a strut from here to here. So when I put them on and off, which we're gonna do a bajillion times in this particular case, I don't have to keep measuring this. It just is what it is. All I have to do is go flip, loosen this a little bit, it comes right off. If it's something that you're putting on a rig that you don't plan on taking off, you don't have to put, you know, anything in here if you don't want to, I guess. I don't know what you're hauling. A canoe, wood, bicycles, barbecue grill, whatever, sheet rock, car parts. I'm not sure. So that's the nice thing about these kits is we're trying to make them universal enough to where you can do whatever a guy wants to do. So let me get a paint marker, mark this up. We'll uh, make two of these quick, setting it up to where we just have to cut one end, of course, and then uh, drill those holes quick in the drill press, get them bolted in. Rack's coming along here. I've got one by, you know, just drill the hole, put a bolt through. These are extremely strong. I'm gonna shake the whole car, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and put a rod from here to here, like I was talking, just so I can unclamp these, take the whole thing off, and just put it back on, and I'd have to keep measuring all that. Went to my local steel supply store. They surprisingly didn't have any rebar, but get this, a guy that was there said, hey, filler, I got a stick in the back of my truck you can have. And that's where this came from, and there was enough to cut two pieces. So I'm gonna do something like this, give it a little decorative flair, maybe and then uh, it should be good to go I might even just I don't need to but I might tack these just because I think this is gonna stay with this car going forward and I guess if I ever wanted to use it for anything else I could just psh, grind that off grind that off cut this off it'll fit on anything with the drip so let me get the welder over here and uh, maybe a mega mimp start tacking these things in well, I tell you what, these don't need much. Just a little z that's all. Too much. Perfect. Well, who was wearing my helmet last? It's all wrong. Oh, I think that was me. Okay.
just a sizzling. I wonder what John Anderson is doing. He's kind of been quiet recently. I feel like he needs to open a restaurant or something. Keep a guy busy, you know what I mean? Okay, now, how do I reach the other side? <laughs> I don't. Great. Well, and with that, the roof rack is done. We'll have uh, two wheels up there, but I mean, we could also make a basket in here and haul fuel or whatever we wanted to, I guess. But I'll just have the two slicks up here. We'll probably run some all thread through the center, knot those together, and then just run a strap to the front, hook it, and a strap back this way and hook her on, or even to this, I guess. Probably just be easiest to go right to here. And I don't think those are going to go anywhere. This thing is, I mean, you're going to rip the roof off before anything happens. But that's a, a neat storage solution, a set of running a trailer or trying to put a hitch on this thing or whatever else. Now the entire trunk is for luggage, jack, jack stands, tool cases, parts, oils, fluids, yada yada. We got the back seat and then we could just put the tires up here. So that'll work pretty good. Well, it has been another long night. I think I'm gonna call her, go get some rest. Tomorrow we need to be pulling out of here we're in pretty good shape. We gotta mount some wheels and tires. We gotta get the slicks mounted. We gotta wash this thing. Decide if we're gonna shine juice it or not. And then get this and the money on the trailer and point it towards Orlando, Florida and go have some fun. See you guys in the morning. Well, good morning. Late last night, I tried to mount these Hoosiers on the rear tires of the car and I just ain't got the ability right now. I can't push and pull throw them around like you usually do. So I'm gonna run those into town and have the tire shop mount them, which is a good excuse to try out the new rack, which also means we gotta put the other tires of wheels on the vanishing paint that I picked up for it, which is gonna be a street set of tires. I don't know, for the foreseeable future, until I change my mind or these go bald basically. I think you guys are gonna like these, check these out. So this isn't a terrible look. I just decided to change it up a little bit. One would argue it's a little bit too modern, maybe, especially what it's going to look like here when I'm finished with it. So I decided to shake things up and go way old school, take it all the way back. So I picked up these Firestone wide oval. Now, these originally would come in a bias ply, but these are actually a radio, so they're going to go down the road nice on the old school Chrysler steel wheels. And this isn't correct, but I got these old school cop car hubcaps that are also gonna go on here. And uh, it's what I could get that I got in stock. These actually came out of Rusty Acres for Chrysler wheels. I think it's gonna completely change the look of the car. So give me a few minutes to knock all of these on. We'll get the tires thrown up on the roof rack, run into town and get the slicks mounted. Well, we got her down to the wash. Gonna get all the stuff washed off of it. It's looking so much better, in my opinion, with these tires and wheels. Oof da may. Just wait till I get her outside so you can really see her. Got the tires dropped off at the tire shop. They're gonna mount those up for me. And then we'll be able to strap that down, finish packing the car. We don't have much left. That's done. Got to take a look at that, start loading tools. Got to check the rear and then grease it. That's it. Well, the VP is all washed up, so we got all that sanding dust off. Well, most of it, there's still some down there. I do have some fresh metal showing now from where I was sanding it. Then also, obviously, we have all the old rusty metal here. I have decided to go ahead and shine juice this. This is like a temporary isher solution so it's not like clear coat this is oil based 
where the satin matte and gloss are an automotive grade urethane gloss. This is an oil-based covering, and what it's going to do is protect this bare metal, lock everything in. But depending on your environment, you might have to put it on, you know, a couple times a year. But it's going to slow down all this deterioration and stuff like that. It's going to be really shiny when we first put it on, but once it dries, it'll be like a matte finish. It's going to look like this hood, but basically the whole car here. My friends Chad and Cohen showed up. They're going to help out. They're going on sick week with us. Between the three of us, we'll have this thing wiped down in no time. Nice thing about the Shine Juice the oil based one, there's really no application process. You just dump it in a bucket, take an old rag or t shirt, and just smear it on. Super easy to put on. So, we're going to Shine Juice this quick, see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. 